We're here at the Racing Post Pricewise, Tom Sigal's house. He's very kindly uh, opened his doors to us to answer up some of your questions that were asked earlier in the week. Uh, Tom, first and foremost, thanks for having us. And secondly, most viewers have been asking about your methodology behind how you price up a race. And well, firstly, Mark Compton's asked, what variables do you look for? What are the sort of key points you look for when beginning any, any preparation? Oh, there's two main things. Well, there's three main things I look at. I Price, obviously, first and foremost, with me being a price-wise tipster, you know, some of these short price favourites are out the window straight away, even if I fancy them to win. Second thing would be the conditions, the suitability of the horse for the race, not necessarily the ground, the preparation they've had, how they're coming into the race, if they're coming in in good form, if, they, if I feel they're going to run their race on the day. And the third, third point, which I think is remarkably unlooked at, if that's a word, uh, uh, in general studying of races, and that's the jockey. I think the jockey is by far the most important factor in any race for me, bar the ability of the horse, the jockey is the second most important factor. And so therefore I'd be very keen on having jockeys on my side, especially in the big handicaps, the races I tend to specialise in. So Tom, on any normal Saturday, at what point do you have to make your selections and get them in to the paper? It's not my decision at all. I, I'm totally at the behest of the bookmakers. They will tell me which races they are prepared to give their prices on the night before. Hence, those will be the race I'll look at, at fr on Friday at about 11 o'clock. One of the bookies will phone me up and say, this is the race we're going to look at. So that's the only time I can really start work on these races. So when people say you have a lot of time to look at it, you're only looking, I actually have a very short amount of time. I have from about 11 o'clock to about three o'clock when I have to get my copy in to the racing post, three, you know, three four o'clock. So I only have about four or five hours. And if you're looking at a Cheltenham meeting, you know, obviously Cheltenham, we know they'll be pricing up all the races, but it, it's still, you don't have as much time as people would suggest. Also, I'm, I tend to uh, collaborate the tables as well. So I'm the liaison between the, the bookmakers and the racing post. So they will phone me with the prices they're offering. They'll be different from the ones you'd see on on the websites, you know, at twelve o'clock or whatever. So there'll be a different there'll be a different price altogether. So I'll be the, the liaison between the two. I'll be compiling the boxes and I'll be sending them over as well with the the finalised prices that will go in our paper. So it's not all a bed of roses. A lot of people think I'm sitting here just got all day to look at horses, and I don't. I have a lot of other responsibilities to go with it. But having said that. I know what they're going. I know the big races they're going to do at the weekend. And we've had a tweet from Paolo who's asked. Uh, obviously, you've had great success in both flat racing and jump racing handicaps. But do you find you have an edge in any one in particular? Just all handicaps, really. I think. I think the problem is with group races and, and level level weights races. You, the margins are small. Everyone knows the best horses, really. Whether you do it by speed figures or form or you know, data analysis, however you do it, I think it's pretty easy to come to the conclusions about which are the best horses. The bookmakers can do that too. So consequently, I'm finding it, I find it harder to find a great edge in those races. There's an occasional one where you think they've got it wrong, you know, therefore we can get stuck in. But generally in handicaps, uh, the bookmakers don't know, you know, the, the, the idea of them is that everything mm. finishes together, you know, and so therefore little edges are magnified because it's a handicap and also you're getting bigger fields and bigger prices. So therefore that's the reason why I find handicaps suit my style best. But lots of other people's are different. You know, I know plenty of people that can't stand handicaps and never look at them and find they make their money on the uh, on the conditions races. But for me, I just think the way I look at races, I'm looking at factors that aren't necessarily in the public domain. I'm watching a lot of races and I'm sort of trying to find, as I say, the suitability for the conditions and the suitability for the race. One of the most popular topics uh, from people emailing in was about your anti-post betting. Now you've had great success in the past of jumps and flats, synchronised in the Gold Cup, rule of the world uh, in the Derby to name but a few. How difficult is it for you to be making a selection that far in advance? It's exactly the same as handicaps. I think the, the, the thing is you're, you're dealing with horses that people don't have a handle on yet. I'm projecting what might happen in the future. Mm. Rule of the world was a bit of luck. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You know, the chest of ours was coming up. It was Aidan O'Brien's runner in the chest of ours. It happened to be a very good horse. Synchronised, I just thought, the, 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 you know, the, he, he was, he's been winning handicaps and people thought he wasn't as good as the horses that have been running in the conditions races. All of a sudden he gets the conditions he likes, there's a bit of rain, things turn in his favour and away you go. He can win the Cheltenham World Cup because he's such a stamina laden, good, strong, strong staying horse. So all I'm looking for is something that's probably slightly under the radar. I'm not looking at figures or uh, what they've already done. I'm trying to predict what they might do and that's why I think uh, anti-post rating suits me. So when you've had a great stretch of winners, say, like you did back in 2005, I think it was 10 consecutive Saturdays, do you ever let that get you carried away? Do you ever let it run away with you? 
No, absolutely not. I think that's the one advantage I have is during good or bad runs I'm the same. All I'm all I'm trying to do is tip the winner of the next race. Don't matter what's happened the last five million times. The next race is the one I'm concentrating on. I can't I can't do anything about the ones that have gone. So Russell's asked, is there any point given the time of year we're at now in the autumn when you switch codes from flat to jumps? And in which case, how difficult is it? I mean, people talk about this as though it's some sort of, you know, splitting the atom or something. The jumps is going on all the season. I watch jump races. I watch good jump races. I've been watching, I watch a lot of Irish racing. I watch mm. lots of, you know, the good stuff in the summer. I don't see a cutoff point. Obviously, the better horses are coming out now. We saw on uh, Sunday, didn't we? The new one looked really mm. good. And Arcona ran in the, ran in, over at Nate, uh, Navin or Nace in the, uh, in a handicap on the flat there. So we're seeing the better horses come out. I, I, I don't see the cutoff really. I just, you know, one moves into the other. And when the jump season is in full swing, you're pricing up a race. Uh, runners from Paul Nichols, from Nicky Henderson, top trainers, very short prices often. And do you find that you can find value elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the case. But the problem is they win. You know, that's the problem. Paul Nichols and Nicky Henderson dominate so much. There's, you know, other trainers come in from time to time. So ideally, I'm looking for races that they're not in handicap. Staying handicap chases, two mile handicap hurdles. They aren't really the realm of Paul Nichols. They're certainly not in two mile, despite having won the county hurdle a few times. They've been big with big price ones. And Nicky Henderson tends to all of a sudden be, you know, be the man to follow in all chases. You mentioned the new one and our Connor. Sean McCarthy on Twitter has asked which of the novices from last year stood out to you that you might think might make a big impact on the championship divisions this year. Yeah, well, those guys. There's two for starters, mm. aren't they? They were novice hurdlers that could make them up. I would suggest my tent or yours has clearly got a got a chance in that. Mm. I don't think Champagne Fever will be quite quick enough. I think they'll probably go chasing with him rather than go for the champion hurdle, especially because they've got Hurricane Fly. But, you know, those three there are top hurdlers. I'm a little bit less keen on the, the novice chasers from last year. Simon Sig's obviously very good, but he's got Sprinter Sacra to beat. I don't think I've ever seen a horse better than Sprinter Sacra, so I would imagine they'll keep themselves apart. And I'm sure you saw this one coming. Uh, plenty of people, too many to name check, have asked what is your jumps horse to follow this season. And this comes straight to mind, this one. The West Wizard. West Wizard for Nicky Henderson. Uh, won a bumper, I think it was at Kempton on his soul start. It might have been a novice hurdle. One of them, whatever, but I know the Hendersons are mad keen on this horse. They very, very seldom get it wrong with their novice hurdlers. I'd be surprised if he doesn't turn up to be a supreme novice hurdle candidate and then on, on to be a horse that we, uh, we come to be well, well accustomed with in the future. West Wizard, I think, is going to be a really good horse.